Oh, hey everybody. Uh, welcome to Read Science. We've been on a bit of hiatus. The, um, well, the pandemic sort of has uh, slowed a lot of things down in life, but uh, we're back and we are so excited today. I'm happy to see Jeff again. Uh, nice to see you, Joanne. Talking except on Messenger, right? Um, and But uh, today we're welcoming our guest, Greg Gaber, who um, has written a book. He is a physicist. He is an author as well. And his book that we will be talking about today is called Falling Felines and Fundamental Physics. And you have a teeny tiny uh, subtitle, A Headlong Dive into the Science of How Cats Land on Their Feet. And um, so I've actually read his book twice now because I read it when it first came out <laughs> and I read it again to prepare for this. And I can tell you it's interesting both times. And um, I love cats and I love science. This worked out really well. So a little bit more about Greg. Um, I've known Greg for a few years, thanks to science communication circles, um, because Greg has a blog, or maybe two blogs, two <laughs> blogs, one about yeah. horror and the history of science. So I guess I only read the history of science one, <laughs> Greg. And um, But really, your real job that pays the rent is a professor of physics and optical science at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And... Um, Oh, you contributed to the book Science Blogging, The Essential Guide, So, oh, which I think we've talked about on this show. <laughs> so, yeah, welcome. And you have cats. I do. I do. And <laughs> they would probably make appearances again during this. I'll be very surprised if they don't, especially once I start talking again. They'll be naturally kind of trying to get in here. <laughs> Are you talking to me? Are you talking yeah. to me? <laughs> That's what cats like to say. <laughs> I play games online with friends, and one of my friends has cats who's all who are always in her face. And so, in the middle of doing something, she'll just be like, "Stop it! Get out of here!" And be like, "Okay, are you talking to the cats again, or are you talking to me?" <laughs> That's how it goes, right? And she so. always says that she's talking to the cats, but I'm never quite <laughs> sure. <laughs> one thing that struck me, Joanne, while you were showing us the book and introducing it is that the title falling felines some people might look at and try to figure out what it's an allegory for or a metaphor for and the answer is no the book is literally about falling cats <laughs> exactly and i think i think we should establish that we are talking about falling <coughs> cats uh in this which is a great thing so uh but no mischievous 12 year olds no, no, dropping no, them no, off and no cats were harmed as far as we know uh, yeah those not in recent years. <laughs> yep. Not mine in the making of my book. Um, people have constantly asked me, did you drop, do you drop your own cats? I'm like, no, like the book says there's hundreds of years of research on this topic. And the internet is filled with videos new and old of falling cats. So. Falling cats. And we're, we're going to see one of them in just a moment. First, I think I want, I want to start sort of historically at the top and then ask a question that is on the non-physicist mind, perhaps. Um, first, I want to read, you quoted this little bit of reaction to a film by Monsieur Marais uh, at the French Academy meeting of the 22nd October, 1894. And the dates, the dates are useful to keep in mind. This was reported a little bit later, but quoting, when Monsieur Marais laid the results of his investigations before the Academy of Sciences, a lively discussion resulted. The difficulty was to explain how the cat could turn itself around without a fulcrum to assist it in the operation. One member declared that Monsieur Marais had presented them with a scientific paradox in direct contradiction with the most elementary mechanical principles. Now for the demonstration, this is, I think the one that they saw. as a series of photographs. Yep, that looks about right. Good yeah, job, then there will be a, uh, a real-time version here. Actually, it's smart to get a black background and a white cat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> OK, and then the question of mine to, to start things is like, is uh, I've worked as a physicist, you're a physicist. What makes a twisting cat so 
obviously interesting? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I think it's just that it is such a, well, first of all, it's such a kind of an iconic problem. Everybody knows about this problem. And um, so everybody knows, knows what you're talking about when you talk about a cat landing on their feet. But from a physics point of view, it turns out that it's not that easy to come up with a simple answer for how it works. Um, and that goes back to the quote you shared that when it was for, when the first high speed photographs came out, people were just sort of shocked. Um, and the well, journalists yeah. had a field day. <laughs> because before that, they knew that we had the expression uh, and there were there was a theory that was accepted about how it happened. But uh, and this is sort of a physics thing, you know, when you have new ways of looking at things, you have new things that you see photographs or slow motion, basically, of a cat falling revealed things that you couldn't see happening in the what three tenths of a second it takes to do whatever it's doing. Yeah. So this was a big breakthrough. And the people who first saw this were astounded at the time, it sounds like. And I, I could imagine the picture recreate or the movie recreation of people yelling and throwing furniture, and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> fighting about whether he's made it up <laughs> or something. But there's also the question that was in the back of my mind or the, the, the thought the whole time I was reading your book is... This is a, a, an interesting little disconnect with communication with the public where physicists look at this and we go, there is a problem and I can see it's a tricky question and we usually refer to something like this as a sweet problem to solve. And in fact, there are fundamental principles at play here that seem to be contradicted and we've got to work that out. But we know that politicians and headline writers and the public culture sort of enjoy mocking science for, can you believe they're, they've got a $100,000 grant to study a quack cat falling? Right. Uh, you know, and the, whoever it was years ago, he used to give golden fleece awards in Congress. And, uh, so there is a bit, and that's, that's, that's a question that's guiding me. It's like, this really is an interesting and important problem. And the fact that it's also fun does not take away from that or, something like that um yeah physicists are also interested in like curveballs in baseball because nobody really knows quite and, yeah and it's such it's such a uh, a fixture of science and news reporting and science fiction to say this uh scientists are totally confounded by and and usually it's stuff like you know quantum mechanics and things like that and in fact they're not confounded by any of that but they are confounded by curveballs and cats falling <laughs> and now I don't I forget what the question was but it's just interesting because it seems to violate the conservation of angular momentum and maybe that's a good thing to explain to kick off talking about it yeah um so yeah I mean one way that I because conservation of angular momentum can be a little subtle to explain to people but the way I often do it these days in a non-technical audience is I say well, most people are familiar with kind of conservation of momentum. If something goes, th if, if, if I have two objects and I push this way, something has got to go the other way. That's conservation of linear momentum. Uh, if there's an oomph in one direction, there's got to be an oomph in the yep. opposite direction. And for angular momentum, it just turns out there's a rotation, rotational conservation as well. If one thing twists to, you know, but to the right, let's say the other thing has got another something else has to twist to the left to make up for it. So the best example and probably one that most physicists use at some point that I use to demonstrate this is just say if you're sitting in a spinning office chair, if you stick out your arms and you twist your upper body to the left, the chair overall is going to turn a little bit to the right. And that's your conservation of angular momentum in action. Something's twisting right because something else twisted left. Um, and um, for physicists, this was a really fascinating part of the history reading the book, because as a physicist, um, I wasn't aware of the history of the discovery of the conservation of angular momentum. Mm -hmm. It's not really talked about. Um, and a lot of that is, is that 
unlike a lot of discoveries, there was there wasn't like a big aha mm -hmm. moment per se. It was just a lot of people kind of making observations and somebody make an offhand mm -hmm. comment in one scientific paper and somebody else picked it up <laughs> and suddenly everybody was kind of in agreement. Um, and so- And thus the it came about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so there isn't quite as dramatic a story as there is for things like conservation of energy, where you've got doctors doing bloodletting who figured out stuff. Um, but um, and we can talk about that more if you want in a moment. But um, for the biologists, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, but so so angular momentum, there wasn't a lot of discussion, so I had to kind of go through and be like, okay, because clearly when Mary's uh, Mary's photographs came out conservation of angular momentum was already around and there was clearly some sort of fundamental misunderstanding about it. And I like to describe it nowadays that it's a perfect example of kind of a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. That often when you think you understand something, um, when you first started looking at it is the point when you're most prone to sort of catastrophic misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. And as, as I'm sure you know, I like to stress that this this is normal in science. I mean, yes. we learn something new. Yeah. Um, we met we we kind of at our first understanding is very imperfect, and then something comes along to upend that, and we we kind of go through this process of new material coming in, and it changes our view. But the view, you know, the dramatic changes start really big, and then they kind yeah. of settle down. <laughs> Well, um, we've we've seen that during pandemic times, at least, of the public gets a little upset and feel uh, off kilter every time a new uh, refinement to our understanding is done. But scientists typically get excited about discovering that there's yeah. a subtlety involved. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that certainly was the case because before Marais did this showed these pictures at the French Academy meeting, there was a theory, everybody was fine with it. Everyone knew when you dropped the cat, it uh, it pushed off from the table or from your hand and that was how it could rotate. Mm. And his picture said, no, it didn't start rotating until after it was falling. And that's where people start throwing the furniture and things because yeah. you can't do that without violating angular momentum. and if we're going to have angular momentum violated, it's not just going to be from some stupid cat. It's important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That, and, and that was sort of the, what um, reporters latched onto and had a field day with is yes. sort of the, the, the seeming mundanity of the problem that, okay, <laughs> here are these physicists saying that a cat is violating fundamental laws of <laughs> physics. I mean, if you don't expect you don't expect to find, you know, your domestic house cat to be the one to break break all the rules. Um, so well, it's still, it's, we still have that same joke with, as everyone knows, uh, bumblebees can't fly. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, right. And now we know it's like, and physicists are interested, feel that a cat turning is, yeah, and mind blowing. Yeah, and the way I I'd usually describe it is what ended up happening is so the first descriptions, the, so this idea of angular momentum that there there was this idea that, okay, if you're rotating, you have angular momentum. If you're not rotating, you don't have angular momentum. And so physicists in that mid 1850s had that picture, but that picture really only applies to rigid bodies. So if you have, for instance, I've got a 50-sided die ah. here. <laughs> yeah. I have weird dice collections, among other things. So, you know, th the thinking is this is a rigid body. It doesn't bend or, tw bend or twist. So if it's turning, it has angular momentum. If it doesn't, it doesn't. So physicists in that era were looking exclusively at rigid bodies, and they kind of internalized without really making the statement explicitly, they kind of mm -hmm. internalized this idea that, yeah, angular momentum is basically rotation, that mm -hmm. um, you can only have it if you're rotating. And so you can't, and so their argument was you can't start rotating if you don't have angular momentum already. Mm -hmm. The only way you can get angular momentum is by pushing off of something. Right. So a cat must push off of something 
to get itself turning before it before it actually is falling. And that was what Mary's pictures contradicted. And I, the, the simple way of explaining what they got wrong is anybody who's ever looked at a cat knows a cat is not a rigid body. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I have a great photo of my cat, Cookie, who spends her, she likes to contort her body in ridiculous angles. And, <laughs> and that was what those early physicists hadn't, hadn't really occurred to them is, yeah, a cat doesn't have it, it. It doesn't have this one-to-one -one connection between rotation and angular momentum because different parts of its body can rotate in different different directions, basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so it has the freedom to reorient that a bicycle wheel doesn't. If you drop a bicycle wheel in space, it can't change its direction because it's one solid object, and. To the credit of the French Academy of Sciences, they all pretty much, after the initial shock of that first meeting where everybody was arguing, the next time they showed up, everybody showed up with their papers explaining, okay, mm -hmm. no, wait, now I got it figured out. Okay, this is how it works. <laughs> because that's what a bunch of scientists do when they... <laughs> yep. Yep, you figure, oh, yep, there's a picture of Cookie. Um, I, I, I have a wonderful photograph of her um, she made that exact same pose as a kitten. She's been doing that since she was about three weeks old. <laughs> and speaking of cats, I said a cat would make an appearance yep. here. There's yep. a kitty. But then Hello. this realization and the nice, well, I hope the nice thing, if one enjoys that sort of writing and things, about writing a, a, a book length uh, discussion of the cat turning problem is that uh, you get to look at... Uh, digressions along the way that aren't really digressions. So once people yeah. realized that the cat is not a rigid body, there was a pending question about the Earth's motion that used uh -huh. that. It's like, and they've known that it just hadn't been brought up to where they notice it. So maybe a brief moment to say, no, wait a minute. There's, this is the first sort of serious thing that has come out to say that this is an important problem. Yeah, um, yeah, and that was that was a description. So kind of we know that the Earth rotates on its axis. We know it rotates orbits around the Earth, but we also know that it has some extra wobbles, what we call precessions, um, so that the axis direction changes periodically. And there are there are a few of those precessions that are sort of that were pretty well understood once we understood that the earth was a spinning object moving around the uh, sun. Um, but there was this extra anomaly. So right, co it was sort of coincidental that the timing was perfect that, um, well, first of all, um, it went back uh, several hundred years that I think it was the mathematician Euler who said there mm -hmm. should be this additional wobble of the earth because the earth isn't a perfect sphere and mm -hmm. just like honestly if i take my you know weird top shaped die and i spin it it's going to wobble around as it spins because it's an irregular shape and if i spin it along an, an axis that's not one of the preferred mm -hmm. axes mm -hmm. it's going to wobble so euler knew and predicted that the earth would also have this extra wobble and so they found they they kind of found that too, but then, um, and I'll probably screw up some of the history because it's been a while since I read my own book. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so an, an, a, an amateur astronomer named Chandler, they were everybody was looking for sort of an this extra anomalous wobble, um, and couldn't find it. And then Chandler, who wasn't even really looking for it, happened to find it. Mm -hmm. But. The reason that Chandler found it where everybody else didn't is that the, everybody had a good idea of how, what the, this, what rate this wobble should be happening. So they were all mm -hmm. looking for a wobble of the earth of a certain frequency and they couldn't find it at that frequency. And then Chandler, who was just looking for anything, found it at a different frequency. Mm -hmm. And then the question became, well, why is the measure the measured value of this wobble different from the one that was predicted and that we think we understood pretty well? And that's where the cat problem came in is that um, 
another mathematician came, <clears throat> excuse me, came along and said, well, wait, we're assuming that all of our calculations have been assuming that the earth is a rigid mm -hmm. body, but the earth itself, we have an atmosphere that's fluid. We have oceans that are fluid. We have ocean currents. So even the earth itself is not completely rigid. Mm -hmm. So, so we could expect that it can, it can change its orientation in an unexpected way, just like a cat can because of that non-rigidity. And so, yeah, it's, it's, Amazing that right off the bat, there was somebody who looked at that cat problem and went, huh, there's a connection here to yep. Yep. A, yep. a mystery involving the entire earth. Yep. Now, I'm about to let Joanne talk. She knows she's very patient. But there were a couple of <laughs> quotations. Historically, we're about at the right point where I think there were a couple of key things here. And one that will keep turning up is when you wrote early on in the book that technology limits uh, to good observation of a cat flipping as mm -hmm. it does because it only takes a third of a second and it's beyond human perception itself. And that's why there's this recurring theme of new ways of looking. But there was another interesting one that went by a little faster, but still talking about uh, Marais, whose name is Etienne Yules Marais. You said... He, you described me, he believed all animals were subject to physical laws and could be understood by studying them in motion, which is a nice transition to the next thing that you know comes up in this. But also the notion of you know, animals and souls and is the soul animating this somehow. And this is, this seems like a very early physicist, reductionist, everything is physics viewpoint says no, they're physical objects, they follow physical laws. And that's that's a that's a big shift too, isn't it? Of starting to put away the the supernatural idea of the of the animal fluids and the motivating forces and things that do this. Oh yeah. Um yeah I believe so. And I, I yeah and I didn't I didn't do enough research into all of the consensus <laughs> thinking about the soul and mm -hmm. what animates living creatures but yeah it was clear that mare was very much of that attitude of well we can it, it makes the most sense to just view mm -hmm. animals and living creatures as just machines and we just don't understand all the mechanisms mm -hmm. by which they work yet and this was at odds with a number of his colleagues who really did still have that sort of dual nate dualism idea that there's you know, life and everything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was a bit, it, yeah, it was a bit, um, a and bit the, of a dramatic departure. The late part of the 18th century is not, is not a familiar scientific milieu. People thought a lot differently. There's no evolution yet. There's no sense of deep time of the ancient history of the earth. People thought fossils were amusing decorations in rocks and they had not yet made the connection with with there being the remains of animals that no longer exist. Uh, all, all sorts of things, geology, biology was in a weird place too. And so yeah. today to say, well, animals are machines and they have to obey the laws of physics sounds like almost nothing. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, It was a big thing almost as much as saying, no, the cat turning problem is important. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and those are just a lot of those philosophical. Uh, I mean, the the that nineteenth century was a really big century for these big philosophical mm -hmm. changes. The way we look at the world, even those conservation laws that I talked about, mm -hmm. conservation of momentum, conservation of energy, those are all really mid nineteenth century discoveries. And it's funny because we take them all so for granted right. nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, but they are relatively recent revolutions mm -hmm. in physics. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it, I find that part of the history fascinating <clears throat> myself, just looking at how recent a lot of the things are we yeah. take for granted. And yeah. As, yeah, as as someone educated in physics, when you go through a physics education, you're just sort of taught, okay, these are the things we know. And yeah. it's fascinating to go back and read a little closer and go, ooh, 
how did this yeah. came about so recently? And yes. if I'd been studying this, if I'd been studying this subject 30 years earlier, I would have been totally lost. Totally <laughs> lost. I, uh, I think we all have those. My, my favorite sort of mind blowing. No, it's been less than a hundred years uh, since we learned how the sun works with fusion. Yeah. We yeah. didn't know that before 1937 or so, which I, I find just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Joanne, <yeah>. please. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm now I, lost in I am sort of I'm sort of <laughs> um interested in two things, but let's start with just one. The um, you know, there's a whole section on space and cats. And you know, we're getting to this question of does gravity play a role in how the cats do this, which then sort of goes to biology, like how does a cat perceive gravity and therefore mm -hmm. decide it's time to turn. <laughs> you know, yeah. So, so, but let's let's look at space, and then sort of we can segue into neuro neurology, and yeah, okay, the right, cat brain yeah. and things like and that. And I know we're going to discuss Moybridge because he comes in uh, <laughs> to the picture here too. But yeah, it's sort of all these major landmark or milestones mm -hmm. and the cat turning problem. Yeah, and that was part of what I really loved about the book and why I decided it would make a good book yeah. is you kind of go through and you find all these major disciplines looking at the cat problem and also all these major figures, like it's touching upon major people in all these different areas uh, that are like, Hey, let's look at a falling cat. Um, and made me go, well, there's clearly something here that all these really smart people were seeing. But a lot of people were not. <laughs> we're not right. Yeah. And um, so what would you like to discuss first about the space part of it or just the role yeah. of the cats? Of the yeah. Well, Let's see. I, you know, let let's let's take a look at yeah. So, um, I mean, I remember a headlines. few years ago. I remember a few years ago the videos of cats in the parabolic plane. Oh yeah. Um, oh my gosh, <laughs> I thought poor kitties. So yeah, let's start there. And the other thing that struck me in your book was they had uh, an astronaut or a, a trampolinist oh, <laughs> dressed yeah. in a in a um, spacesuit <laughs> yeah. trying to mimic the movement of the cat. Yeah. So yeah, it, it kind of the whole cats, it, it's funny that cats played sort of two important roles in the space program or in space programs mm -hmm. in general. Um, one, well, and it all, but it all came back to the falling cat problem. And mm -hmm. so when, when we first started thinking about putting people into space, one of the really big concerns was nobody was quite sure what would happen physiologically to a human being in space. So there were concerns that, okay, well, we know that if you, you know, you drop somebody, if you, if you drop someone, if you drop someone off a diving board or something, they're weightless for, you know, maybe a second at most or two seconds or several seconds if they're skydiving. Mm. But there was a concern, okay, if you put someone in a weightless environment in space, what's going to happen to their nervous system? There was a thought that our nervous system might be calibrated to Earth, to having gravity on all the time, and that our brains might genuinely freak out if we're forced to experience weightlessness for an extended period of time. So that was, so a lot of early tests of rockets where they sent animals up in rockets, that was part of what they wanted to see is, okay, let's send animals up and be able to monitor how they respond to being in a weightless environment. Mm -hmm. And the cat, and it's funny that in this book, in each chapter, the cat often comes in sort of at the very end. Um, <laughs> that it's sort of after everything else has been done, somebody says, well, why not try cats? Um, but after they started doing these weightless experiments, it became very natural to say, well, we know that these cats seem to have this direction sense in free fall to land on their feet. So how will a, how will a cat react in weightlessness? And yeah, my fa one of my favorite photos in the book is the sequence of photos of a cat in the cockpit of a fighter jet. Mm -hmm. Because before they had the the big plane where they could do the parabolic trajectory before they figured out that they could do those, I guess, C-130s, I think they were, mm -hmm. where they could take cats up and just stand in the chamber and drop them. 
all they could do is take fighter jets on these parabolic trajectories. So, you know, credit to the brave pilot who said, I'm going to take a cat who will probably be very angry with me into this confined cockpit of this high speed jet and let it go and see what happens. And <laughs> yeah, I like you got random legs here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah. So first he has to, holding the cat as he's flying. And then the second one is, okay, let's see how, if the cat can write itself immediately after we go weightless. And then the cat, la cat writes itself. And then the third set is, okay, let's, you know, let's, let's, let's have a, a weightless for a little longer and then let the cat go and see what it can do. And then the cat seems to struggle a bit more to get right side up. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was something very interesting, which alluded to your second question of uh, the gravitational response. Mm -hmm. But yeah. let me try well, and stay on track, though, first and get continue. <laughs> oh, but go ahead. <laughs> but the right side up part is interesting because now you can make we're back to the physics. Sorry. But now yeah. you can make that that very almost direct connection surprisingly to uh, Einstein general relativity and the equivalence principle. Yeah. Where did that come from? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's another fun part of the book is I didn't think I wouldn't have thought when I first started writing a physics book that I would be having to address general relativity in it. But yeah, almost as soon as as soon as as soon as Einstein's general relativity came out, people started to realize, wait, there's something weird about what a cat's doing, because mm -hmm. if yeah. it's in free fall, it doesn't have any preferred direction. And mm -hmm. so if it's blindfolded. And a cat that's blindfolded and dropped still lands on its feet just fine. And so now then people were asking, well, wait, how did again, we were back to cats violating the laws of physics. How yes. does you right. know right. that it which way is down when it can't sense it? And yeah. do you want to talk about that first or the other part of the space <laughs> part first? Uh, go ahead. Continue on. <laughs> OK, well, I guess we'll I guess I'll start with the. Um, yeah, the the other the the gravity question. So, mm -hmm. so well, partly this is what what they found in those space program um, those tests is that cats seem to retain a memory of which way is down that lasts for several seconds even if they go into a weightless environment. Mm -hmm. And there was another physiologist in the in the UK. Uh, whose name uh, is going to escape me. Um, I got in contact with one of his colleagues to get permission to use the photo of him with his musical instrument that appears ah, in the book. It uh, is here. The uh, bassoon. Yeah. Or the so, rational yeah. bassoon. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> but so he did some experiments because he was curious about this problem. And turns out that rabbits also have this writing yes, reflex. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I still, for the life of me, am not exactly sure why. why I have a couple yeah. of hypotheses, but no definite idea. Um, yep. Uh, yeah, Giles Brindley. And uh, with the lodge, his electronic bassoon. Um, so <laughs> I, I, include, yeah, I included that just to show that um, he, he's a very clever researcher with unconventional approaches mm -hmm. to things. And so... Mm -hmm. He got curious about how an animal knows which way is up and can land on its feet. And since rabbits flip can flip over basically just like cats can, he tested it. He would put it, he would take an animal and through some sort of accelerated path. And while the cat's accelerating, and this is back to sort of the general relativity, it effectively thinks or feels that the direction of gravity is different. Something's mm -hmm. wrong. Yeah. So, so for instance, he had a rabbit in a box and his wife, I guess, drove the car and he did the experiments in the back yes. and they were at an airport <laughs> and they drove the car in kind of a steep <laughs> circular path so that, so that not only is the cat feeling the force of gravity down, but it's feeling a sideways force of what we would often call centrifugal force. Mm -hmm. So for the rabbit in the box, it thinks, it effectively thinks that gravity is now sideways. Mm -hmm. It's it's equivalent for the as far as the rabbit's concerned, it's equivalent to tilting the box sideways. It's like okay, now the gravity's going the other direction, and so he'd have his wife drive in a circular path, and at the end of the circular path, they would open up the box and let the cat or let the rabbit fall, 
and then see which way it tried to land on its feet. And then they found that under those conditions, the rabbit did try and land sideways mm. instead of landing right side up. And so the interpretation that came out of this is that what's happening in a cat or a rabbit's brain is that, that it, it's, it's key, while it's under the influence of gravity, it keeps kind of a memory of the direction mm -hmm. that gravity is pointing. And it keeps that memory of that direction of gravity for five or six seconds um, so that if it does fall and it can't see which way is down, it can instinctively end up that way. And it's really kind of nice in the book too, because I don't think anybody ever made the connection. Brindley did his experiments and said, well, it looks like there's about a five or six second memory. Mm -hmm. And then a few years later, the Air Force people planning for the space program um, did these experiments in airplanes. And they also said, well, it looks like about five or six seconds mm -hmm. after the cat goes weightless, it loses track of which way is up. And, uh, you know, as a scientist, it's really nice when you see, oh, here are two independent experiments done in very different methods. And they got basically the same conclusion, but they didn't know it because they weren't talking to each other. Right. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this is the cat contributing to neuroscience yeah. uh, understanding and things about vestibular system and balance and all, well, all sorts of stuff and general relativity. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, there's a picture of a turtle in here. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I have a quotation for that. <laughs> I, it's yeah, like we got wrote, rabbits and that. lots of cats and then the, this random turtle. That's, yeah. yeah, that's the snake-necked Amazon. Mm -hmm. No, the snake-necked. Oh, shoot. Oh, which one is it? The snake Yeah, all I have turtle. to do is find yeah. it. Argentine, yeah. Argentine, yeah. The snake-necked mm -hmm. Argentine turtle. And <laughs> Oh, here, here it is. The perfect... Subjects for orientation studies, the Argentine snake neck turtle. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. And in, in that case, it came down to the fact that this was again in that era when they were trying to figure out how humans or animals would adapt to a weightless environment. And these turtles are really good at grabbing food really quickly. Yeah. And so it was assumed that that was part of their kind of balance system and uh, and their orientation system. So they were curious whether they could orient them, whether they could still grab their food as effectively in a weightless environment. Mm -hmm. And this gives you the really funny picture because they had to have a big tank of water open at the top because they're feeding these turtles at the top and they're taking <laughs> these big tanks of water on weightless trajectories. So <laughs> there were real potentials of dousing everybody in, with in the water. airplane with water and potentially angry turtles, <laughs> um, angry biting turtles. <laughs> but um, so one of the interesting things that came out of this was that so they had they happened to have one turtle of a group that had lost its vestibular system which mm -hmm. uses for balance mm -hmm. and they didn't do that deliberately the turtle just accidentally was damaged but it ended up being a great control subject because this turtle after it had its injury it, it spent a couple of weeks struggling to figure out how to grab things again but then apparently it it adapted. It was able to use its eyes, its eyes corrected, and it was able to use its eyes to figure out how to grab food just as well. Hmm. And now they said, well, now let's take let's take a normal turtle and this damaged turtle up in the aircraft. And now for the normal, and now they found that the normal turtle had a really hard time at first. The normal turtle. Now its vestibular system is going haywire in the weightless environment, and it doesn't know how to grab it prey. But the turtle that's adapted to just using sight did just fine. Mm -hmm. And and that sheds light. the The whole question is like, why do why are they messing around with the turtles? That there is a serious question, it's like how much of their prey capturing uh, is visual? How much depends mm -hmm. on recognizing which way is up? Yeah. Uh, and this was a chance to turn off the up for a while to yep. see how it contributed yep. in, a, in a rather clear way. Yeah. And also to see whether 
um, these animals could adapt to the weightless environment because that was mm -hmm. our concern is can humans adapt to living in a weightless environment or would we just go crazy and just not be able to do anything? And so they found that first the, the turtle that was already missing its vestibular um, system did just fine immediately in a weightless mm -hmm. environment. And the turtles that were still intact, they could adapt. They took them up on different weightless flights and they just did better and better with their connection. So this was a really good study to indicate that, yeah, when you take a human up in a weightless environment, they will probably have some initial disorientation, but their brain will be able to adapt and rely more on sight than on that sense of direction mm -hmm. for orientation and balance. Yeah. I um, actually want to, to talk about another cool picture, um, uh, the, <laughs> this tramp, trampolinist. Yes. Oh. And trampoline. So we have a series yeah. of pictures here where it looks like a uh, trampolinist in a spate suit. So we've got a falling cat. Yep. So what's happening here? Now, surely that's not serious science. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was very much NASA funded and very interesting to the space program. Um, so this was the second part of how cats played a role in the space race. So about those time, about the time that those famous videos of cats being dropped in sort of the weightless planes mm -hmm. were being made, uh, there was already there wasn't that much interest in watching a cat in a weightless environment anymore. I think they did that more for novelty because at that point they were convinced, okay, a human can a human can survive in space and an orient in space, mm -hmm. or at least they won't go haywire. Their brains won't <laughs> freak out. But then the next question came about. Okay, how does a but how does it how can a human orient themselves if they're in a space station and say they get say they get stuck out in the middle, you know, the middle of the area of the space station, they're not near a wall. How can they turn around mm -hmm. with no angular momentum? Yeah, with no angular right. momentum. They're just floating there. Um and just and just to make the train astronauts to be as efficient as possible maneuvering around in a weightless environment. So right. this brought back in the cat. They said, well, we've got this natural, this natural um, subject that can teach us how to flip over. And so they, so they, well, they did a number of studies with this, um, but this particular study that was done by some engineers, Kane and Cher, um, they, they tasked them with doing a serious, detailed, analytic model of how a cat flips over. Mm -hmm. And um, so there, by that time, people pretty much qualitatively knew how a cat turned over. Mm -hmm. They kind of they had the basic idea. But there's but, a pretty good model for it. Yeah. Uh, right. But, but it, was a, it was a good model, but it wasn't like a quantitative model mm -hmm. that you could tell someone, okay, this is exactly how a cat does it. So right. Kane and Cher were tasked with saying, okay, how does a cat really do it? And then can we teach a human to do it? So, well, the, the way the process worked is they took high-speed photographs of cats. Um, then they plugged it into a computer model and the computer, their computer model said, okay, this is what a cat is doing. And then they, you know, basically printed out that model and handed it to an acrobat <laughs> and said, okay, mm -hmm. put on this spacesuit, bounce on this trampoline and try to reproduce <laughs> these motions. We want to see if a human being <laughs> can do that same bend and twist like a cat can. And this particular set of photographs, which originally were published in Life magazine, um, show that comparison that, yeah, you could get an astronaut in a spacesuit, which can be quite bulky to do a similar sort of bend and twist rotation like a cat to turn over. And over the years, have they determined that, yeah, this is indeed the best way when you're, <laughs> if you need to write yourself? You know, <laughs> I've never, I've never found any official comments from like any astronauts or anybody at NASA. My, and one other thing I'll mention about this is there was a book before we really started sending a lot of people into space, they published like a manual, which you can find online with a bunch of motions. So they, 
they had this sort of training manual for how to maneuver in zero G mm -hmm. and they had a lot of bunch of funny motions. Like, okay, if you want to rotate around your vertical axis, you swing your arms above your head like this, yeah. like a lariat. <laughs> if you want to flip end over end, you can flip your arms this way. Um, yes. Uh, no. And my friend, Amy Shira title, who um, mm. yeah. yes. we've, we've had Amy, we've had Amy. Okay. On the yeah. Show. She's written yeah. a few yeah. books on space. Mm -hmm. um, last year she did a, an Instagram video where she kind of did sort of an old timey motion picture demonstration of a bunch of these motions. If you <laughs> ever get the mood to look them up, it's really charming <laughs> um, and really well done. So, but yeah, so there was this detailed manual produced, but I don't think anybody ever really used it significantly, or I've never found any evidence. Mm -hmm. My my guess is is that they prepared this manual because they didn't really know how easy it would be mm -hmm. for astronauts to maneuver. And then they started sending people up there and people just figured out whatever Intuitively worked best. Intuitively yeah. figured it out. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, it turned out it was easier to just figure it out instead of trying to read a book and following it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. One of the one of the cat falling that you described, one of the cat falling contributions back when we were talking about neuroscience was to the study of reflexes and how all that works and the amazingly complicated way that we even managed to stand up and how that works with reflexes. But the notion, uh, the, the discussion by uh, the main scientists doing this stuff of that basically, you know, cats don't work this out. They don't study physics. Various. <laughs> various reflex actions are triggered and this is their response and it causes this to happen and so nasa is naturally going to worry about whether heads will explode in zero g after 30 <laughs> seconds and things but it seems like that that the answer is you put them there the astronauts are weightless they need to turn around it triggers some actions and it's not long before they figure out how to turn around yeah yeah that, that it just yeah, it just comes more or less naturally once you start. Once you're in that environment, if you're yeah. if you're sitting in it, honestly, if you're sitting in a weightless space capsule or whatever for you know hours at a time, you're probably going to have some free time to uh, try this out anyway. Well, most of us sitting at our desk know that if we lift our feet off the floor, we can still wiggle around yep. to reach something on the shelf, <laughs> not violate the laws of physics. True, true. I have. Let's see. Yeah. A short, a short one. There's a fun story. This go, this goes back. Yeah. But um, and uh, this is a quotation from I think about halfway through the book. There are many types of feuds in the scientific community, but none of them are typically more angry and less productive than a fight over the priority of discovery. <laughs> and this was Volterra versus Piano in what about the mid 19th century well it was actually yeah it was actually like 1896 90, okay it was right after Late, the, right the, the mary end. photos came out yeah and i can't you know i can't even remember now what they were arguing about but people love to write books about these scientific feuds oh yeah um and that was a classic that was a classic one. Oh, the, oh yeah that was the the perturbations yep yeah it was mm -hmm. So they yeah, the wobble in the earth. Yes. Yeah, it came. Yeah, it came about because um, yeah. So there was this this Chandler wobble, and people were trying to understand how it worked. And Piano um, had looked at the falling cat problem and said, "Oh, that makes sense. That a falling cat's not rigid, so we can do weird motions. So probably this un unusual wobble of the earth is because the earth is not completely rigid." And then we've got and so. He published a paper kind of saying this and sort of alluding to, oh, this cat gave me this great idea. Yeah. Um, but it turned into a feud because Volterra had been working on this problem for several years, or at least mm -hmm. a year, I think, mathematically. It had, without the, without the cat, had come to kind of the same conclusion that non-rigid parts of the earth would make it an anomalous wobble. <laughs> but Piano... It, it, my impression is Piano is, you know, a very brash kind of guy and didn't necessarily <laughs> think too much about the implications of his words. And, you know, he kind of, his paper kind of, his cat paper, well, the way it works is, <laughs> the way it works is that Volterra had basically submitted his, had 
Uh, his paper, I think, came out first, but Piano yeah. had given a presentation first. Yeah. And so Piano kind of implied, well, you know, Voltaire's work is very interesting, but, you know, he probably got the idea from talk, listening to me. Yeah. <laughs> and Voltaire then got infuriated and it just turned into this back and forth escalating argument. Um, yes. <laughs> and I really enjoyed writing that chapter of the book because... It really helps if you're a scientist who has published papers <laughs> to see all the subtle little things they were doing to get at each other. Yeah. Like if you were just reading this at, without some background in how scientists write, you wouldn't necessarily catch things like like the fact that I believe it was um, I believe it was Volterra who, you know, deliberately left out any reference to Piano's work and citations. Yeah. So mm -hmm. just snubbed him, said his work is not important at all without saying yeah. it, just leaving it out. And, and, I, and Piano and, sort of took every opportunity to say, well, Volterra made this interesting observation, which accorded with what I saw three years earlier. Exactly. <laughs> sort of thing. <laughs> and, and, and Piano kept mentioning the cat, implying <laughs> that it was all due to the cat cats that he got the idea. And, um, and so it was fun. And I tried to lay that out in that book chapter, like yeah. all these little things they were doing to poke each other. And clearly Volterra was the one who was not in the mood for games because he yeah. just kept getting more and more upset by it all until he appealed to the highest scientific community in the country to say, hey, make him stop. And, uh, and Piano probably plays the part of the cat with the mouse at that. In that that uh, was, yeah, that was... <laughs> That's a pretty apt analogy there that he really just <laughs> tweaked him enough to uh, and just played with him a lot. But yeah, it was in the end, it was a very unproductive um, yeah, argument because, well, nowadays we all know very well that, yeah, people, scientific ideas are often very often independently discovered by yeah. different people in the um, yeah, when when it's time when the time is right to get this idea out there, it's often discovered multiple mm -hmm. times. In times, fact, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah, in fact, yeah. Uh, yeah. I did this in my own research about a year ago, or about two years <laughs> ago, in fact, that I came up with this great idea, wrote a paper with my student Charlotte, and then um, a few months later, after the paper was published, I realized that. My colleagues that I work with in China had independently done almost the same thing. Yeah. Mm. Um, though being petty, I looked and I'm like, ah, I beat him by a month. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Because precedence. Yeah. There's but one yes, other definitely. quotation I wanted to read before. I think this is from very late. Uh, and that's because you, you, you've got a sort of uh, time sequence going through the book. So if, Around the same time in 1885, the world's first modern skyscraper went up in Chicago, though other tall buildings had been erected for decades. The 10-story home insurance mm -hmm. building was the first to use structural steel in its frame. This innovation in material strength led the way to increasingly taller buildings, both commercial yes. and residential, and to cats taking up residence at higher, higher altitudes. Inevitably, cats began falling from those heights and odd discoveries were made my addition but it's like i what is this this is called this is called what cat skyscraper syndrome or yeah. our feline high-rise syndrome is i yeah. think what right, they usually right. call it and yeah it's um so it originally it was originally sort of recognized in the 1970s and it was originally recognized just by um by veterinarians a veterinarian said well i'm getting more and more cats coming in that have this certain set of injuries because they've been falling from really large heights. Yeah. And so the first paper on feline high-rise syndrome was just a paper to say, this is what you need to look out for. Or if somebody brings in a cat that they say fell from a skyscraper, mm -hmm. these are the injuries you should check for. Mm -hmm. But then other vets in the 1980s started to notice, well, there are these certain classes of injuries that these cats have that fall from skyscrapers, but cats that fall from higher heights mm -hmm. often seem to have fewer injuries than the cats that fall from lower heights. And that became another, uh, this seems to violate the laws of science kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> this seems to go against what you would expect. I mean, you might expect that after 
a certain height, they don't have any additional injuries, but you wouldn't necessarily expect that certain types of injuries would go down. Yeah. And so that's sort of now intimately, More science. Yeah, <laughs> intimately connected to this, the, the name fault feline high rise syndrome is the curious conundrum of cats falling from taller heights seem to do better or have fewer injuries. Yeah. Yep. Than ones that fall from lower. And this is the only technical plot I think I put in the entire yeah, book. Yeah, everything else because... are great photos, <laughs> you know, historical yeah. photos. Uh, this was the only one I'm like, there's no way I can actually explain this without a plot that just says, yes, yeah. as the cats fall from higher heights, the total injuries seem to go back down. Yeah. And right. so <clears throat> the rest so injuries for, in know, this, yeah. We're into Split pallets, the next fractures, hundred years of yeah. <laughs> cats contributing to science. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and um, there isn't there isn't a really good explanation. There isn't a I shouldn't say there are there are good there are reasonable explanations, but there isn't a you know a, a definite explanation for this. You mean um, scientists are confounded by how this can happen? Scientists confounded, <laughs> yes. Headline. <laughs> um, but part of that is just that. Um, well, we're not doing ex we're not doing controlled experiments on this. Thankfully, right. we're not just dropping yeah. cats off of skyscrapers because we don't need to. This is not a pressing problem that needs a mm -hmm. definite answer. So mm -hmm. we rely on we rely on just when things happen um, and what vet data can give. A retrospective and, there. <laughs> yeah, and the well, one of the cons one of the views that seems to be quite reasonable is just that that the, the, the peak of injury seems to happen around the sixth floor and then they seem to go mm -hmm. back down a bit. Uh, and so the speculation is six, six floors up is about how high a cat has to go to hit terminal velocity as well. Mm -hmm. And again, going back to sort of a general relativity thing, when you're in free fall, you're in a weightless environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And everything feels really weird. I can speak to this because as a skydiver, I've jumped out of hot air balloons and genuine weightlessness mm -hmm. is a really weird feeling. Mm -hmm. And so it's natural to think that a cat in actual free fall has, the, has this sort of clenching moment like, oh, geez, and, and freaks out and is rather, you know, tightens up their body, sort of the reflex. But that can contribute to more injuries when you're really make all of your muscles rigid. Yeah. But that once they hit terminal velocity, they're falling at a constant speed. They feel the force of gravity again. They feel a downward direction and that they have a little bit of time to relax and just mm -hmm. say, OK, I can absorb this impact. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that's sort of the best guess of what's going on there. Um, there could still also just be some weird bias in the cases that are actually brought to the vets versus mm -hmm. not brought to the vets because <laughs> because we're not doing controlled experiments we're relying on those animals that are brought to the vet and some bias may be causing certain animals to be brought and not brought um but it's another i love i love examples like that because it's just another example of how a cat has surprised us with mm -hmm. something very non-intuitive that doesn't doesn't seem to make sense at first um and the book is kind of a tribute to all these weird puzzles that cats have mm -hmm. <laughs> yes yes and I it, it was, theoretical and real you yeah know? <laughs> it's worth pointing out that by the end of the book you have brought us up to date on the state of the art in understanding uh the cat turning problem uh so you don't leave us dangling on that yeah. It's all the way up to nowadays there are people doing robotics work. Um, yes. So I like to say that, yeah, we can trace the problem from about, we can trace it as a scientific problem from about 300 years ago when Isaac Newton was still alive, all the way up to the present day where there are people still interested in this problem for a variety of reasons. Right. Right. Yeah. And it was, it was very interesting that you brought all that. So, you know, I know we're nearing the end of our time. But I did want to ask, so I heard a story that this wasn't the original book you were supposed to write <laughs> when you went to the publisher. So what's the deal with that? And does that mean there's another book coming out? Uh, yes, it does. Um, so yeah, um, my, <laughs> my background in physics, my PhD was on sort of early investigations of invisibility physics. How do you make something uh -huh. invisible? Uh -huh. And... 
So I, I knew a lot of, I know a lot of the history and I've done some research in invisibility physics, but know all the history of invisibility physics. So when the publisher originally approached me to say, hey, do you want to write a popular science book? I said, hey, I could write a book on invisibility physics. And then I happened to stumble across all these <laughs> papers on the cat problem, and became obsessed with the cat problem and said, I wrote to the publisher and said, well, I know we've been talking invisibility, but would you mind if I write this book first, this cat book? <laughs> and so they were fine with that. Um, but now I'm back working on, I'm about maybe two thirds of the way through a draft on the history and science of invisibility, which also kind of is this surprisingly long history that goes back to the 1800s and all the way up through modern developments. And that's Hopefully we'll be done this summer. <laughs> Good luck. Good. Yeah, I hope so too. It should be interesting. So that that one should should draw in a lot of attention. People who are interested in invisibility in movies and uh, superheroes and things like that. Um, yep. Whereas as this book probably uh, garnered some attention from cat lovers. <laughs> I right? hope so, and I think you so. Hope yeah. So. I, I, I know a lot of people that have read the book who said that they then got the copy for their cat loving friends. <laughs> yes. Um, and the cat that was, market. Yeah. That was one of the reasons why there are a, a, a ridiculously large number of photos in the book. I, my publisher was originally, <laughs> you know, my publisher was originally like, do you really need that many photos in this book? I'm like, it's a book about cats. People are going to want cat photos. <laughs> they want cat photos. And yeah. It's the internet and you, age. You got a lot of, um, the best I could tell, a lot of um, commons, creative commons photos. So you weren't having to purchase all these photos, right? Yeah, yeah uh, I, I focused on, I had my, my roommate and friend did a number of illustrations for me. Yeah, about those were good. Um, yeah. Then, yeah, a lot of them, a lot of the older photos, of course, were either, or there were a lot of creative commons or a bunch of older photos that are in the public domain. Though I did have to pay through the nose for some of them. The trampoline cat photos oh, were uh -oh. really pricey. Um, Uh-oh, have we violated some rules by sharing it on video? Oh, no. I, if I, I get a nasty letter, I'll, <laughs> I'll be like, sorry, yeah. it's educational, I promise. Yeah. I, 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 get, I don't think so, because those photos are all over the internet anyway. But okay. it's more that if you're publishing it in a book, then you have to pay through the nose for it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I ended up doing a fundraiser for the book back in the day because oh, the cool. price of the photos was in the thousands of dollars. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. I was like, I really actually would like, I'm not going to make much money from this book, but I would like to actually make some money. From mm -hmm. this right, book. right. So I did a fundraiser with autograph books going out to people yeah. who contributed nice. and um, managed to get all of that, the cost of the, the priciest few photos in there but mm -hmm. yeah i don't yeah. intend it, i don't I think intend it to helps a lot it helps a lot and um actually so what one version uh, i listened to and one version i read okay. so it was great to to that what i'm looking at mm -hmm. is called the pdf that comes with the audio mm, okay. so for those of you who listen to audio and go well, i'm missing a picture <laughs> there's almost <laughs> always a pdf to go with it oh. so yeah so you don't miss out yep oh daisy oh, came hello daisy Daisy wanted to make sure she made an appearance <laughs> on camera before we wrapped up. I was going to yeah. say, is this a current cat or a friend cat or a, this one, Sophie? Oh, Sophie. Yes. Yeah, Sophie's a member of my extended kitty family. She lives with my ex ex right now who I'm still mm -hmm. good friends with. So I visit them from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, that photo was very funny because I was like, it would be fun to have a photo of a cat sitting on a string theory book. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I knew exactly what I had to do. I just had to put the book of string theory on the floor mm -hmm. and within five minutes, a cat was sitting on it. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. You got it. You got it. <laughs> That's you, can't really, you can't really train a cat, but they are predictable in a number of ways. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. Wow. Well, um, you know, I really appreciated the book. Um, and I, it's, it's definitely, I don't know, this is a history book and it's going to be a classic. I think when people go, Oh, how do, how do cats do that? They, they can go pick one well, up. The cross disciplinary science is very enlightening too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know. This is not just physics, a little bit of neuroscience yeah. and, mm -hmm. you know, and understanding the vestibular system and brain yeah. and 
the history yeah. of high speed photography. High speed yeah. photography and yeah. I, I learned a lot in writing it and I was really delighted when I wrote it how all the topics started to tie yeah. together. Mm -hmm. Like all the neuroscience stuff almost seemed like a side chapter at first, but then you get to robotics mm -hmm. and all of that comes back in. Suddenly there's a reason for me talking about inner ears and yeah. <laughs> reflexes. It, it all did end up to to me the you know the the new coming reader to it as as a good logical flow of through all these these things of telling the story as as his time went on. So that worked out very well. Yeah, and I think better. we instead of saying, oh I bet that was easy, I think we should ascribe it to your masterly writing <laughs> technique. <laughs> yeah. well, I appreciate there it. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And if you want to see more cats <laughs> you you show them on your your Twitter timeline, right? Yep, yep. They yeah. appear on my time my Twitter often. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and my Instagram from time to time. They get there too. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining us, Greg. We're really glad, and thanks for writing the book. And looking forward to the book on invisibility whenever okay. that hits the shelves. Right. Yep. Thank you very much. This has been great and a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks very much, Greg. Great. Yep. We'll see you guys all um, hopefully soon. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Bye.